Joseph's brothers want to kill him, but was he asking for it? Face it, you're a bunch of losers. Welcome to the Bible Paladin. We will be getting one of my all-time favorite stories in the Old Testament. You're gonna love this story. We will be following Joseph on his journey of self-discovery, dependence on God, and his love for his family. Our story begins with a few short concluding sentences about Jacob, as we hear that he settles in the land of his fathers before him. And then we will turn to his children and follow them on their stories, which unfortunately, like Jacob, is filled with strife and struggle. And so we ask the Lord to bless our reading of the sacred text. Jacob settled in the land where his father had stayed, the land of Canaan. This is his family history. When Joseph was 17 years old, he was tending the flocks with his brothers. He was an assistant to the sons of his father's wives, Bilhah and Zilpah, and he brought his father bad reports about them. Israel loved Joseph best of all his sons, for he was the child of his old age, and he had made him a long tunic. When his brothers saw that their father loved him best of all his sons, they hated him so much that they would not even greet him. Once Joseph had a dream, which he told to his brothers. Listen to this dream I had. There we were, binding sheaves in the field, when suddenly my sheaf rose to an upright position, and your sheaves formed a ring around my sheaf and bowed down to it. Are you really going to make yourself king over us? His brothers asked him, or impose your rule on us? So they hated him all the more because of his talk about his dreams. Then he had another dream, and this one too he told to his brothers. I had another dream, he said. This time, the sun and the moon and 11 stars were bowing down to me. When he also told it to his father, his father reproved him. What is the meaning of this dream of yours? He asked. Can it be that I and your mother and your brothers are to come and bow to the ground before you? So his brothers were wrought up against him, but his father pondered the matter. The beginning of the story sets up the relationship between Joseph, his brothers, and their father. We are told at the beginning that he is shepherding the flocks with Zilpah and Bilhah's sons, whom he would be closer in age to, but still younger than them. And yet he is the one that goes back and reports to dad. And the reports, we are told, were not good. Strike one. He is also Jacob's favored son. And Jacob doesn't seem to care who knows. In fact, he gives him this beautiful cloak, which the Septuagint translates as a cloak of many colors. And that's the description that has pretty much stuck over the years. Although the actual Hebrew is a bit unclear, but it seems to mean a long-sleeved uh, decorated cloak, which would signify a particular honor or status that the son would have. Strike two. And then we are told that his brothers hated him. And the same word is used that we've seen before, sani, which means they had wanted nothing to do with him. And we are told about these two dreams that he has. And the fact that he has two dreams signifies that it was important and that even that it came from God, as we will hear later. And what did the dreams signify? Well, just as his family interpreted them, that at some point they would end up bowing down to Joseph. And after sharing his second dream, we are told that his brothers were jealous of him, using a word in the Hebrew that in this context seems even stronger than hate. Even his father reproves him, although he may have been more upset that Joseph shared the dream, because he probably was considering this in his heart, what it could really mean. But Joseph seems to be quite naive at this point in his life, and he's got his head in the clouds. And so let's see what happens next. One day, when his brothers had gone to pasture their father's flocks at Shechem, Israel said to Joseph, Your brothers, you know, are tending our flocks at Shechem. Get ready. I will send you to them. I am ready, Joseph answered. Go then, he replied. See if all is well with your brothers and their flocks, and bring back word. So he sent him off from the valley of Hebron. When Joseph reached Shechem, a man met him as he was wandering about in the fields. What are you looking for? The man asked him. I am looking for my brothers, he answered. Could you please tell me where they are tending the flocks? The man said to him, they have moved on from here. In fact, I heard them say, let us go on to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and caught up with them in Dothan. So it seems that all of his brothers, that would be all of them except for Benjamin, who still would have been a child at this time, were tending flocks at Shechem. Wait, Shechem? The place where their sister Dinah was raped and they completely sacked the city? That should raise some red flags and remind us of the violent nature of his brothers. And yet Joseph goes out there all alone and wearing his fancy cloak. 
So he may have been brave, but not too bright. Once he gets to Shechem, he can't find his brothers, but he encounters a man. Interesting. When his father and their fathers encounter a man with no name that gives them information, it is typically a messenger or angel of God. This certainly could be the case here too. But why would an angel direct him to his brothers who have ill will towards him? Ultimately, to accomplish God's plan, even if it involves suffering for a time being. So he is told to go to Dothan. All told, Joseph's journey to find his brothers would probably have taken about five days. And having to travel so far to find pasture for their flocks could be a foreshadowing as well to the famine that will come to the land. And so let's see what happens next. They noticed him from a distance, and before he came up to them, they plotted to kill him. They said to one another, Here comes that master dreamer. Come on, let us kill him and throw him into one of the cisterns here. We could say that a wild beast devoured him. We shall then see what comes of his dreams. When Reuben heard this, he tried to save him from their hands, saying, We must not take his life. Instead of shedding blood, he continued, just throw him into that cistern there in the desert, but don't kill him outright. His purpose was to rescue him from their hands and restore him to his father. So when Joseph came up to them, they stripped him of the long tunic he had on. Then they took him and threw him into the cistern, which was empty and dry. Then they sat down to their meal. Looking up, they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead, their camels laden with gum, balm, and resin to be taken down to Egypt. Judah said to his brothers, What is to be gained by killing our brother and concealing his blood? Rather, let us sell him to these Ishmaelites instead of doing away with him ourselves. After all, he is our brother, our own flesh. His brothers agreed. They sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver. Some Midianite traders passed by, and they pulled Joseph up out of the cistern and took him to Egypt. When Reuben went back to the cistern and saw that Joseph was not in it, he tore his clothes. And returning to his brothers, he exclaimed, The boy is gone, and I... Where can I turn? As Joseph approaches his brothers, we are immediately told of their intentions, and they refer to him as the dreamer. Oh, dreamer. And they plot to kill him. And of course, being so far from home in the wilderness, they could have easily hid his body in one of the cisterns, which unfortunately seems to have occurred a lot more than I would have thought. But anyway, Reuben, being the firstborn son, and seeing himself as his brother's keeper, tries to convince his other brothers not to kill Joseph. And he partially succeeds, as they decide to throw him into the cistern without killing him first. And then they all sit down and have lunch. These guys really have no conscience. The next part is a bit confusing, as we are told that a caravan of Ishmaelites arrive, and they plan to sell Joseph to them. And then Midianites pass by, who take him from the well and sell them to the Ishmaelites. Finally, Reuben goes back to the well and is surprised that Joseph is gone. Where was he when this was happening? There are a few ways to interpret the story, and either way holds some weight, so let's look at them. Many scholars point to the existence of two versions of the story that were combined together to form this one narrative. And of course, we've seen this happen in other places in our reading of Genesis. This would also explain why at first it is Reuben that speaks up for Joseph, and later it is Judah. Also, in this version, the Ishmaelites come by, who are descendants of Ishmael, and his brothers take him out of the well and sell them to them. And later, when Joseph is in Egypt, he does remind his brothers that it was they who sold him into slavery. Another telling of these events record that they leave him in the well and depart. Later, the Midianites, who were descendants of Abraham and Keturah, took him out of the well, and then they sold him to the Ishmaelites. Then later, Reuben returns to the well alone and is surprised that he is not there. Also, in a subsequent chapter, we see Joseph tell one of the Egyptians that he was stolen from his homeland, which would agree with this account. So depending on which version, his brothers may or may not have directly sold him into slavery. Either way, they successfully got rid of their brother because of their jealousy towards him. Another way of reading the story is to see it as it is written, as one narrative. And in this case, both Reuben and Judah try to save their brother, although Judah's reasoning may have been more to make a profit off of selling him. As far as the traders are concerned, Ishmaelite has been used elsewhere to refer to any nomadic travelers, like Bedouin nomads, while Midianite is more specific and refers to a particular ethnic group. The names can be more or less interchangeable, or the group of travelers consisted of both. It is possible that Reuben was disgusted with his brothers after they threw Joseph into the well and started to have lunch, and then he went off, possibly to check on the sheep. He didn't return then until after Joseph was already taken from the well. 
So in this case, it would have been his nine other brothers that sold him into slavery. And so let's continue reading. They took Joseph's tunic and after slaughtering a goat, dipped the tunic in its blood. Then they set someone to bring the long tunic to their father with the message. We found this. See whether it is your son's tunic or not. He recognized it and exclaimed, My son's tunic! A wild beast has devoured him. Joseph has been torn to pieces. Then Jacob rent his clothes, put sackcloth on his loins, and mourned his son many days. Though his sons and daughters tried to console him, he refused all consolation, saying, No, I will go down mourning to my son in the netherworld. Thus did his father lament him. The Midianites, meanwhile, sold Joseph in Egypt to Potiphar, a courtier of Pharaoh and his chief steward. According to the original plan, they dip the cloak of many colors into goat's blood, and then they send it back to their father. And they send it with someone not even going themselves, completely removing themselves from the situation. And as predicted, Jacob recognizes the cloak and assumes the worst. And he may even have blamed himself for sending Joseph out alone. And there's also some interesting symbolism here that we might look at. Remember, Jacob deceived his own father with the use of a goat and his brother's clothing. Now his other sons deceive him with the use of a goat and their brother's clothing. His past seems to keep coming back to him. And of course, Jacob tears his garments and mourns for his son. His grief was so bad that he goes beyond the traditional time of mourning and refuses to be consoled. He would rather go into Sheol and join his son rather than live. Then we are told that Joseph was sold in Egypt to Potiphar, Pharaoh's chief steward. We'll return to his story later. The theological layers of the story will become more clear as we continue reading, because this narrative will go all the way to the end of Genesis. Although there is one interruption in the next chapter, which focuses on his brother Judah and his family. And so we'll have to wait in suspense to find out what happens to Joseph in Egypt. But what do we have so far? Well, for one, Joseph represents one who is favored by God. He has given gifts and prophecies and serves as a model to his brothers. Their rejection of him is also a rejection of the Lord. The brothers can be seen as archetypes of the division that will exist within the nation of Israel, which they will become. Even though chosen by God, this does not mean that every decision they make is from God. And in fact, quite the opposite. We are told that they return to Shechem, a place of idolatry and violence. Israel will return to such practices throughout their history and will have to be called back by God. The rest of the story shows the lengths that they go through to rid themselves of their younger brother, who has become a thorn in their side, representing the law and the prophets. At this point in the story, they have no remorse for their actions, and this further tears apart their family. Jacob, or Israel, is deprived of his favored son, and we leave him a broken man, a broken nation. Joseph can be seen as an archetype or foreshadowing of the Messiah. He prophesies to his brothers, his family, or Israel, and yet they reject him and cast him out. Later, we find out that it is Joseph who ends up saving them. For Christians, this can refer to Jesus. Christ is the Greek word for Messiah, which means anointed. What were the reasons that Joseph was hated? First, he was critical of the behavior of his brothers and reported back to the father. When Jesus came, he was particularly critical of the Pharisees and those who thought that they were above reproach. Joseph was clothed with brilliance and favored by the father. By contrast, Jesus was the son of God, but took on the flesh of humanity, as we are told in John's gospel. At his baptism, we hear God say that he is the favored one. Joseph prophesies to his family. He warns them, but they do not believe him. Instead, they reject him and plot to kill him. The family of Jesus is Israel, yet many of them reject him. He speaks about this in the parable of the tenants in Matthew 21, 33 through 46. As we continue through the story of Joseph, we may see more similarities. And it shows us that the message in the Bible is one that we hear over and over again. It is about a God who sees our sinfulness, yet continues to call us back. What inspirational message can I take from this story today? Like many of the stories in Genesis, it is not just about a relationship with God, but also the relationship with family. When we think about family, which of the characters in the story might I relate with the most? Maybe I'm like Jacob, who can't hide my favoritism or displeasure for a certain member of the family or friend. Do such overt displays foster jealousy or pride among the others? Such an attitude can easily tear a family or group of friends apart. Perhaps I'm like the jealous brothers, 
who were unable to see beyond their animosity towards Joseph. Even though they were guilty of bad behavior, they blamed him because he pointed it out. Instead of trying to please their father, they were envious of the love that he was shown. Rather than trying to understand his fanciful dreams, they took it personally and hated him all the more. Their immediate reaction to that which they didn't understand or made them uncomfortable was anger and violence instead of communication and reconciliation. Or perhaps I am like Reuben or Judah who tried to curb such a violent response. They knew what was right and tried to persuade the others, but they didn't go far enough. They were still afraid, and so they only went halfway in their opposition to evil. And then finally, there is Joseph. While he was the innocent victim in this story, he was also naive and a pretty accurate portrayal of a self-absorbed, spoiled teenager. When looking at a purely human interpretation of the narrative, we see that Joseph couldn't see further than his father's love for him and never tried to look at things from his brother's perspective. Tattling on them, wearing the cloak, or speaking about the dream showed that he was oblivious to their feelings. All families often contain combinations of these social dynamics, which can become explosive if not put in check. When we reflect and identify them in ourselves, it then becomes possible to change. The above story, of course, does not end here, but will continue in such a way that we'll be able to see the growth and development of some of these brothers, as well as the movement of God in what happens. As with Jacob's family, God is not finished with us either, even when it seems that all is lost. Thank you for joining me as we embark on Joseph's journey. And I do hope that you're finding something inspirational in these videos. Next time, we're going to take a short detour and explore some more family drama in the household of Jacob. Until then, be a source of unity and reconciliation and do good.